So I'm, I'm an emergency physician, and when I was going through my training, the scariest patients that I saw in the ER were the ones that were brought in by ambulance on a stretcher, looking like they were about to die. And as I got more comfortable dealing with obviously critically ill patients, a very different kind of patient started to scare me the most. And um, those were patients that looked like this. So patients with a little bit of chest pain, some mild nausea, subtle symptoms, but symptoms that could be indicative that this patient that I was talking to was having a heart attack right in front of me. So you can imagine there are many such patients in the ER, and that brings up uh, one of medicine's many difficult decisions, which is, do I do a test for heart attack? Now, um, there are a lot of these patients, and we can't test everybody, but from the outside, uh, it might look to you like we, we sure do try to test everyone. Um, and I think from the point of view of policy research, the one thing we know about testing patients with chest pain or other symptoms in the ER is that we test way too much. Um, and what that means specifically is we do hundreds of thousands of stress test catheterizations um, every year, and when you follow up those patients to see what happens to them after the test, um, in the vast majority of cases, there is absolutely no measurable change in the care that they receive. Um, and I think this um, t unnecessary tests in the ER is almost a metaphor for a broader fact that we know about our healthcare system, which is of the trillions of dollars we spend every year, um, some large proportion of that is wasted. Um, and so when I think about all of the data that I need to integrate into um, my head to make this decision to form a probability estimate and test the right patients, well, you know, um, there's a lot we know about the human mind, and, and one of the things we know is that doing that is not a, a great fit for our cognitive hardware. And so one of the things I was interested in was designing algorithms that ingested a vast amount of data um, from Medicare claims, um, from electronic health records at, at my hospital, um, and helping us with that difficult decision of which patients to test. So I'm gonna show you some results um, and, um, and these results are uh, from Medicare data, but these hold up as, just as well in our electronic health record data from, from the Brigham. Um, and I'll show you a few different graphs that look like this. So on the x-axis here, I'm showing you our machine learning predictions on who's going to benefit um, from one of these tests that we do um, in or shortly after a patient's emergency room visit. Um, so that's on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, I'm just showing you the fraction of patients whom we test in the ER or in the few days afterwards that go on to get a stent or open heart surgery on an urgent or emergent basis in the next couple of days. Um, and one fact to keep in mind is that if you look at the average cost of all of these tests taken together, the average cost is about $120,000 per quality adjusted life year. Um, and that looks expensive. So m most of us in the US and the policy world would use a cutoff of about $100,000 for what we should be paying for, um, and this is above. But what you'll notice, of course, is that this average conceals a lot of heterogeneity in risk. And now that we can make individualized prospective predictions on patients that the algorithm has never seen before, we can start looking at, for example, the bottom 30% of all tests that we do. Um, predictably, I can tell you that those are way beyond any reasonable cost-effectiveness threshold at around $160,000 per quality-adjusted life year or more. Conversely, on the upper end of the, of the value distribution, um, these tests, the top 30%, are actually looking very cost-effective um, at reasonable thresholds in the U.S. And to put that in perspective, this is you know, something that is around the same cost effectiveness as things that we feel very comfortable doing that are very reasonable, like smoking, uh, screening smokers for lung cancer. Whereas on this bottom end, this is about the cost effectiveness of cancer immunotherapy. And I'm all for cancer immunotherapy, but when you start doing that for hundreds of thousands of Medicare patients visiting ERs, this gets pretty expensive. So I showed you data for the patients we decide to test. But there's another group of patients that's quite important as well, and those are patients we don't decide to test. We can design predictions uh, using the same algorithm for all of the untested patients that come through the ER and then get discharged or admitted to the hospital for other reasons. And what we see here is that in that top 10% of predicted risk, according to our algorithm, about one in five patients goes on to have a major adverse cardiac event, 
which is one of these things, um, none of which is particularly good. And so what we're seeing is errors on both sides of the testing distribution. We're seeing low risk patients, predictably low risk patients who are getting tested and predictably high risk patients who are not getting tested. And as a side note, I'll tell you, over testing, testing low risk patients who don't need to be testing, we all know there are bad incentives in our healthcare system. Um, but those incentives have a harder time explaining why we are failing to test patients with such high risk. And that's an important point. Um, one of the nice things about this analysis is that we can then revisit a fact that we commonly hear about our healthcare system, which is that in some parts of the country we test a lot, and in other parts of the country we, we don't test so much. And overall, you know, the, the message from health policy is uh, we want all of us in Boston working at high testing rate academic hospitals uh, to be more like hospitals in, say, Boise, um, Idaho, where they don't test people that much. With our approach, we can actually see when we test more or when we test less, which patients are we actually testing? Um, so what I can tell you is that in Boise, uh, they actually test everybody less. So they test the low risk patients less, which is good, um, but they also test the high risk patients less, which is bad. Um, and in Boston, of course, we just test everyone more. Um, and that's half good because we wanna be testing the high risk patients more. But this, this fact that nobody is really getting this question right um, is the key to seeing why an algorithm could do so much better. And so if an algorithm were making the decision instead of us human doctors, um, we could cut tests by about 40% and still find about the same number of patients who would go on to have revascularization interventions. Or we could do the same number of tests and find 60% more people who would later go on to have an adverse event when they're not tested. And which one of these two is right, or whether it's somewhere in between? I think those are legitimate questions for policymakers to ask. But the one thing that's very clear to me is that anything would be better than what we're doing today. So um, just to tie this all up, I think um, it won't come as a surprise to anyone that doctors make mistakes. But one nice thing about these kinds of algorithms is that they can show us exactly where and on whom and on which patients doctors are making these mistakes. And I think these mistakes will, um, as we look at more and more tests through this lens, um, we'll find this pattern for stress tests and catheterizations, and we'll find it for a lot of other tests that affect millions and millions of patients in the US and across the world. And I think building on this understanding, we can come to a whole range of possible solutions. And so for me, it would be very interesting to partner with health systems. I think um, a very logical extension of this would be um, decision aids, apps, softwares that layer on top of electronic health records. And I'd say even more that these kinds of applications can almost be a use case inside your institutions um, for getting the most out of your data, for unlocking the power of the data. Now, of course, a lot needs to be done, and we've done a lot of work even within the partner system, which has a very advanced um, historical electronic record, to bring all this data together in the same place. Um, and, um, and if that describes your situation as well, we can help with that. And while decision aids and software are the immediate first thing we think of with these kinds of machine learning algorithms, you could also imagine this being very useful to the people who pay for healthcare. Um, isn't it crazy, for example, that insurers pay the same price for every single stress test, irrespective of how good or bad of an idea that is prospectively? Um, so you could imagine taking the idea of precision medicine and turning that into precision pricing uh, based on value rather than some set price. Um, and I think I would also be very interested in partnering with um, anyone who is involved in the payment for healthcare. Um, you could imagine folding this into an automated prior approval process or, or a number of other things once you have the data in the same place, and we can help with that too. So I'll give you one last thing, um, which is building on the, uh, the rich electronic health record data that we have at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. Um, this is the ECG of a patient who came into the ER with chest pain, um, a 40-year-old woman with uh, HIV and diabetes. And I think if I were looking at this ECG very quickly, as I tend to do when I'm working clinically, I would probably agree with the cardiologist that this is essentially a normal ECG, uh, unchanged from this patient's prior. We actually uh, took all of the ECGs from the emergency department and folded them into a deep learning algorithm. And that algorithm actually saw something different. The algorithm saw ST elevation. And while I might have disagreed with that, it turned out the algorithm was right. 
And I think that hints at the great power of these kinds of data moving forward. Thank you very much. <laughs>